Good morning. We, uh, we call it partners because this is not a country club, right? Like if you're going to be a part of this church, we're going to ask you to serve. We're going to ask you to give. We're going to ask you to link arms with us. This is not some place where you come and you complain about the color of the carpet and the coffee doesn't taste good, all right? You can serve the coffee if it doesn't taste good, right? So we want you to partner with us. And so really what all of this is, is an invitation to you. If you haven't partnered yet, if you've been here for a while, you're not a partner, August 22nd, we have a discovery class coming up. That's the first step to partnership. Would love for you to jump in with us and join us on August 28th as we dream about what the Lord might do at Radius over the next three years. I'm Ryan Maloney, by the way. I've been out a couple of weeks on vacation. Now I'm up four in a row, so vacation's over. Excited to be back with you guys as we open up Elijah this morning. Robertson McQuilkin was the president of CIU, the president of Columbia International University for 22 years. He was an amazing man in many ways, but really what defines him, why he's remembered, what he became known for was his complete commitment to his wife, Muriel. Robertson and Muriel met as students at Columbia Bible College. He proposed to her on Valentine's Day and they were married that same year. And for years they raised children and served God together. Muriel, Robertson's wife, taught at the Bible College. She spoke at women's conferences and she even had her own Christian radio show. Muriel loved to tell stories. She would always end these stories with her infectious laughter. But on one vacation trip to Florida, one of her stories brought some attention to them that their lives were drastically about to change. Muriel told a story in the car on the way down to Florida like she always did, but five minutes later, she told the exact same story. And Robertson said, honey, you you just told us that story. These memory lapse episodes began to happen more and more frequently. She would repeat herself. She would lose her train of thought. She wasn't able to put the menu together. They would have people in their homes all the time. She couldn't remember salad. She couldn't keep her train of thought. After rounds of tests, doctors confirmed that even though she was young, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. As the next few years went by, Robertson McQuilkin watched helplessly as his fun, creative, loving wife, Muriel, began to slowly fade away. In fact, it got so bad that when Robertson was away from her, she would become deeply distressed, even terrified. It was a half a mile walk from Robertson McQuilkin's office to their home, and Muriel would make that mile round trip sometimes 10 times a day because she was terrified that she had lost him. One night when Robertson was putting her to bed, he took her shoes off and they were covered in blood because of the walk she was making to see him. He knew he had to do something. Columbia International University needed him full time, but his wife Muriel needed him full time and he said it was a really easy decision for him to make. He resigned his presidency to become a full-time homemaker and caregiver to his wife and for the next 13 years, he stayed home with her took care of her. Man, I don't know about you, but when I hear a story like that, it's something in in me that inspires me. There's something that turns inside of me. It it, it motivates me. But there's one thing Robertson McQuilkin said that really got my attention this week. As Muriel is walking with bloody feet just to see him, just to be with him, he said he was amazed by her love for him and it forced him to ask himself, do I love God like that? Would I walk with bloody feet just to spend time with God? Am I completely committed to God? And that's the question you and I are gonna wrestle with this morning. When I got my COVID test done, I don't know how many of you have been tested for COVID, but I pulled up to this little tent and this nurse comes out and she jams something up my nose to my forehead, right? And she twirls it around like this and she pulls it out and she says, okay, in 15 minutes, you're gonna know positive or negative. And they come back and they tell you positive or negative. And I was thinking this week, I really wish we could do that every morning on the way into church. Instead of swabbing your nose, we would swab your heart. And we would say, is this, is this person positive or negative in their commitment to God? And the reality is that's never gonna happen. But if the Bible would show us someone completely committed to God, if the Bible would show us a life, somebody truly committed to God, then what we could do is we could watch that life, we could learn from that life, and we could stack our life up against it. And so this morning, let me introduce you to a man named Elijah. 
a man completely committed to God, and it's going to force us to check our own commitment level to God. And we're attempting the impossible today, okay? We've got three chapters to cover. This normally would be six sermons. We're going to do it in one sermon. I got a bunch of people looking at me with blank faces. We got to go, all right? We got to go this morning. So I need you to be ready. And any story needs some context for it to make sense. The nation of Israel has had evil king after evil king after evil king. They're in a downward spiral of evil kings. In fact, as you read 1 Kings 16, it says so-and-so was the king of Israel, and he was terrible. He did what was displeasing to the Lord. And so-and-so was the king of Israel, and he did what was worse. But then you get to King Ahab, and it said he was the worst of the worst. He was the most evil king in the history of of Israel, and he's married to a woman named Jezebel, who's basically the wicked witch of the West. She is an awful person. They do not worship God. They worship Baal. They build a temple for Baal inside of Israel. They want Baal worship to become the official religion in Israel. This Baal was supposedly, supposedly the God of fertility and the God over the weather. Well, after 14 years of this Baal worship, the real God has had enough. And he calls on Elijah. You're, baseball fans, like you ever seen the baseball manager go out to the mound and he just can't even watch the pitcher anymore. It's gotten so bad, right? And so he takes him out. He doesn't even shake his hand. He's like, get to the dugout. And he looks to the bullpen and he goes, I need a new pitcher. That's what God's doing. He's like, Elijah, your time. And Elijah burst onto the scene right here. Verse one, verse 17 of First Kings. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, the real God, not your silly Baal, as surely as the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew, there will be no rain during the next few years until I give the word. Now we don't know much about Elijah up until this point. He burst onto the scene here. It says he's from Tishbe in Gilead. And I'll make a long story short. In our terms, he's from the backwoods. He's from Gilbert, all right? He's from Batesburg, Leesville. He ain't from the city. He's not from New York City. He's not from LA. He's one of us. He puts his pants one leg on at a time, just like you do. In fact, James 5, 17 says, Elijah's a human just like us. But he's got the spirit of God on him. He's got the spirit of God in him. He's got the power of God with him. And he rolls up to King Ahab's palace and he says, the real God is about to turn the rain off for three years. This is a direct shot at Baal, the one Ahab and Jezebel are worshiping. Baal is supposed to control the rain, but Elijah says, nope, the real God's gonna turn the faucet off for three years. And as the great Bible scholar Luke Bryan says, rain is a good thing. Right? Rain's going to kill Israel. The lack of rain's going to kill them. It's going to completely wipe them out. There are going to be women, children, and men starving to death with no rain in three years. Rain is a good thing. Let's play a lyric game. You want to? We only got six sermons to do in one. We got time, right? Let's take a little detour here. Now, you got to participate, okay? When I point to you, you sing the song. I want to see how many people know it. You got to do it now. My daddy spent his life looking up at the sky. Not yet. <laughs> He'd cuss, kick the dust, saying, son, it's way too dry. The clouds up in the city. The weatherman complains, but where I come from, rain is a good thing. Here you go. Rain makes corn. Corn makes whiskey. Whiskey makes my baby. Oh, we got some rednecks up in here. I knew it. We might be checking your commitment level to God this morning, but your commitment level to 94.3, the dude is positive, on point. So Elijah rolls up to King Ahab. There's not going to be any rain for three years. Verse two. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook there. You're going to need some water, Elijah. There's going to be no rain. Drink from this brook and eat what the ravens bring you. For I have commanded the ravens to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening and he drank from the brook. God is supernaturally taking care of Elijah. You heard it right. The ravens are bringing him sandwiches 
twice a day. Meat and bread, that's a sandwich. He's bringing him sandwiches twice a day, these birds. Verse seven. But after a while, the brook dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. First, the bird catering service is gonna feed you. Now a widow is gonna feed you. So he, Elijah, went to Zarephath. First thing on your outline. The first thing as we swab our heart this morning and check, are we positive in our commitment for the Lord Jesus or are we negative is this. Being completely committed to God means doing what God asks. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Being completely committed to God means doing what God asks us to do. When Robertson McQuilkin stood with Muriel on their wedding day, and she's got that pretty white dress on, and they're holding hands in front of a bunch of people, and they're saying vows, he was signing up for a complete commitment. There are certain things God asks a husband to do, to put his wife's needs before his own needs, to love his wife like Jesus loves the church, to be committed to his bride, sickness help, richer for poor, death parts them. Robertson McQuilkin was clearly committed to his wife because he did what God asked him to do as a husband. Elijah is completely committed to God because he's doing whatever God asked him to do. Let's look at the examples. God tells him to go hide by a river and birds are gonna bring you food. Elijah goes. He doesn't ask what kind of bird, he just goes. Are the sandwiches gonna be wheat or white? Like he doesn't, he just goes. Then the river dries up and God tells him to move to Zarephath. Zarephath is the center of Baal worship. We live in the Bible Belt. Tony Evans, you know what he calls Zarephath? The Baal Belt. (laughs) It's in the middle of pagan evil worship. God says, Elijah, go there. It'd be like God asking you to move to Iraq if Iraq was a little closer. He goes. Great and very simple question for us this morning as we check our commitment level. Are we doing what God asks us to do? His word is very simple very clear. Love your neighbor, are you? Forgive each other, are you? Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loves his church, are you? Wives, respect your husbands, are you? Children, obey your parents, are you? God says sex should only be between one man, one woman within marriage. Any thought, any lust, any look, any sexual activity outside of that is out of bounds. Following that one, Do not get drunk, are you? Don't sin in your anger, are you? On and on and on, just these basic things. And his word says, if we love him, we'll obey his commandments. There's this connection there. Don't say I love God and then do the opposite of what he asks us to do. Now, are we gonna be perfect? Of course not. But there should be a trajectory of our life that we're becoming more and more like him. Whatever God asks Elijah to do, he does it. God says, go to Zarephath the center of Baal worship. Go to Baghdad. And Elijah, when you get to the center of Baal worship, find a widow. She is gonna feed you. So Elijah rolls up into Zarephath. It says when he walks through the gates of Zarephath, he sees a widow gathering sticks. Now, how does he know that's the widow? He asks her, can you give me some bread and water? And you know what the widow says? I swear to your God, I don't have any bread and water. In fact, the reason I'm gathering these sticks is because me and my son, we got our last meal tonight and then we're gonna die. And Elijah says, no, you're not gonna die because the real God's about to show up. The real God's gonna feed you and you're always gonna have enough flour and you're always gonna have enough oil. And for the next several days, this family, widow, son, and Elijah eat together until tragedy strikes in verse 17. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. Some of you moms, you feel this one. He grew worse and worse and finally he died. Then she said to Elijah, oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, laid the body on his bed. And then Elijah cried out to the Lord, oh Lord, my God, why? How many times have you said that to God? Why? Why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son today? Why God? The second truth this morning about being completely committed 
to God is that being completely committed to God oftentimes doesn't make sense. You can't make sense of it. I want you to think about Robertson McQuilkin when he got the doctor's report that his wife had Alzheimer's disease at a young age. Why, God? I'm the president of a Christian university. My wife and I have devoted our lives to you. We're completely committed to you. We've served you for 30 years. We've given our life for you. Muriel teaches at the Bible college. She speaks at women's conferences. Why would this happen to her? It doesn't make sense. Elijah is asking, why God? I ate from the dumb ravens. They were not even clean and I ate. I moved to Baghdad. I did everything you asked me to do. And now this lady's son is gonna die and she's blaming me. Why? Sometimes you're going to be completely committed to God, but things in your life will not go well. Sometimes you're going to be completely committed to God and things in your life aren't going to add up. Sometimes one plus one is not two in your relationship with the Lord. But what he's doing is he's building your faith. He's building your trust in him. Do you think, well, he's going to show up in a minute and you're going to see it. Watch what he does here with this little boy. Verse 21. So Elijah just carried this dead, this dead boy's body up the steps. The grieving mother is downstairs. And Elijah stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to God, Oh, Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Wow. First time in scripture, I believe that God raises someone from the dead and he lets Elijah participate in it. Do you think this widow's faith is growing in the real God in the middle of Baghdad? You better believe it. You think Elijah's faith is growing as he takes a dead body up the stairs and carries a brand spanking new alive baby down the steps? Well, Elijah's faith better grow because of what's next. You ever watch Netflix, Amazon Prime, and like one season ends and it's the next season and you want to go to bed, but you're like, I got to see what happens next, right? So I go to the next one and the first thing that flashes up is three years later. That's what happens here. Three years later, chapter 18. Later on in the third year of the drought, three years later, three years of no rain, three years of people starving to death, three years of people being depressed, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Yet again, he's just doing what God asked him to do. When Ahab saw Elijah, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? You're the one that said God was gonna turn the faucet off three years ago. You really coming back? I've made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshiped the images of Baal instead. Now you bring together all the people of Israel, join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who were supported by Jezebel, the wicked witch lady. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Don't miss this picture this morning. All of the people of Israel, that's a lot of people are gathered on this mountain. The prophets of Baal are there, 450 of them. One prophet of God is there, Elijah. And of all three chapters that I studied and read this week, this is the verse that jumped out and this is the verse that I want it to jump on you this morning. He's got all these people there. Elijah stood in front of them and said this, how much longer will you waver? hobbling, some of, the, some of the translations say limping. How, many, how much longer will you waver, hobble, limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Number three, if you're gonna completely commit to God, it demands a decision. If you're gonna completely commit to God, it demands a decision. I've got to decide, I'm gonna follow him. When Robertson McQuilkin's wife, Muriel, was walking with bloodied feet to see him at his office multiple times a day, desperate for him, terrified that he was gone, when he realized she was content when he was with her, but she was terrified when they were apart, he knew he had a decision to make. Am I going to commit to my job, Columbia International University, or am I going to commit to my wife? Read his words from his resignation later, letter to the college. The decision was made 42 years ago. 
when I promise to care for Muriel in sickness and in health till death do us part. If you're going to commit to something, it's going to come with a decision. Elijah stands in front of hundreds and hundreds of people on this mountain. He looks at the people and he says, how much longer are you going to waver? How much longer are you going to hobble between God, you want a little bit of God, you want a little bit of Baal? Now, I'm going to help you think about Baal here, okay? How are you picturing Baal right now? Some bearded dude up on the throne, right? What really helped me this week is I read some different things is that Baal is not really a God as much as it is a title, there were hundreds of Baals in Israel. Every region had their own Baal. There was a Baal of money. There was a Baal of success. There was a Baal of fertility. There was a Baal of medicine. And this Baal was, suppo was supposed to control the weather. So please don't make the mistake this morning as you read this and go, oh, those dumb Israelites worshiping their little gods. I would never do that. Yes, you do. And I do too. We have American Baals. We could call them American idols. That'd be fun. Money, power, family, kids, possessions, success, comfort, accomplishments, what I look like, what people think of me, et cetera, et cetera. These idols, these bales, these things that have become way too important for me, for my worth. And it's what I find my identity in. And I can't imagine living my life without them. And they compete for the top spot in your heart. And they're usually not bad things. They're usually good things that we make God things and we want to worship them. At least I do. And we waver and we hobble and we limp back and forth between the real God and these little gods. And Elijah looks at you this morning and says, how much longer are you going to waver? How much longer are you going to limp back and forth? Make a decision. You want to follow that? Follow it. It's one of the saddest things happening in the American church. People who will not completely commit to God, but they won't completely cut him off either. I'll have a little bit of him on Sunday, but he's not going to dictate what I do the rest of my week. It's not complete commitment. It requires a decision, the decision that everything I am is yours, God. You can have it all. That's what Elijah's doing. It's yours anyway. My bank account is yours. How do you want me to spend your money, God? That's what a completely committed follower looks like. My marriage is yours. How do you want me to love my spouse? My kids are yours. My life is yours. You want me to move to Baghdad? I'll move to Baghdad. You want me to quit my job? I'll quit my job. There's nothing more important than you. Complete commitment, not wavering back and forth. It makes me think about a squirrel. How dumb are squirrels? Like you better ride down the road and you see a squirrel and it's like 200 yards in front of you and the dumb thing's wavering back and forth. Boop, 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 boop. And you're like, make a decision, you dumb squirrel. And what happens? Squirrel gets flattened. Man, I, I, I can be a dumb squirrel where I just won't make a decision. I want a little bit of God and I want a little bit of bail. I want a little bit of money. <laughs> A little bit of power. I want people to like me. You got to stop acting like you can waver back and forth. You can't serve two masters. That's what Elijah's telling these people. Pick one. He doesn't too much really care which one you pick. <laughs> you want to follow Baal? Follow Baal. But make a decision and quit hobbling and limping back and forth. Commit to a God and follow it. But Elijah said, hey, let's don't leave any doubt. I'll put my God up against your God. Let's see who wins. It'll be little old me and my God versus 450 of you and your God. It's about to be showtime on Mount Carmel. Verse 23. Elijah says, bring two bulls. He's got all of Israel gathered on the mountain. Bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God and all the people agreed. Now they were silent earlier. Now they agreed. They want to see a miracle. They're not ready to commit, but they want to see a miracle. They want to see a blessing. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime. I love this. Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. That's like me saying, come on, money. You can make me happy. Then they danced and hobbled around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. This is my favorite part. Elijah starts start speaking my love language. <laughs> a little bit of sarcasm, a little holy sarcasm, right? Because some things deserve to be mocked and he's going to mock them. 
You'll have to shout louder, Elijah said. For surely he's a God, perhaps he is daydreaming and my favorite verse in the Bible, or maybe he's relieving himself. You know, he's really saying, your God's on the John. He's too busy. Maybe he's away on a trip or he's asleep or needs to be awakened. So the prophets of Baal, you can just picture them steaming. They shout louder and louder following their custom. They cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Can you not just see Elijah with a smirk on his face? And now God's about to show off. God always likes to work from a disadvantage. Have you noticed that? Think about those uh, gamblers at the cross trying to get Jesus' clothes. And God's about to win. They have no clue. That's what's happening here. Verse 36, Elijah tells him, first of all, Elijah tells him, Phil, just drench everything with water. I'm gonna let God show off, okay? Drench everything with water. Pour water on the bull, pour water on the uh, stones, pour water on the wood, make a little trench and fill it with water. Let's make no mistake here who's about to show up. Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, burned up the bull, burned up the wood, burned up the stones turn up. That's some fire right there. And the dust, it even licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out. They made a decision. They stopped limping. They stopped hobbling. They stopped wavering. They made a decision. The Lord is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And so Elijah kills all the prophets of Baal. He prays and this giant rainstorm shows up after three years because the God of the universe controls the weather, not Baal. And now that everything is done, Elijah has been completely committed to God. He's had this great victory. He goes and retires. He plays golf. He collects seashells on the beach and the rest of his life is easy and comfortable. Not so much. Chapter 19, as we wrap up. When Ahab got home with his tail between his legs, he told Jezebel, the wicked witch wife lady, everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me. She's still worshiping these dumb gods. Didn't show up. They're on the john. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. This is another thing that doesn't make sense to me. Elijah's on top of the mountain in front of 450 other prophets and he's saying, your God's on the john. He's bold, he's courageous. And now one woman says, I'm gonna kill you and he's running for his life. Doesn't make sense. Sometimes following God doesn't make sense. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beer Sheba. Now, some of you Luke Bryan fans are like, hey, if Elijah's got to run somewhere, he might as well run to Beer Sheba, right? A place flowing with milk and honey and old Milwaukee or some other type of beer. I thought that was going to be funnier. <laughs> so he runs to Beer Sheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Don't miss this this morning, verse four. Elijah's just like you. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. So some of you are like, I'm not Elijah. I couldn't stand on there in front of 450 people and shout those things, but you can resonate with this, Elijah. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Number four, being completely committed to God is difficult. It's difficult. For 13 years, while his wife couldn't communicate, couldn't remember anything, Muriel spent most of her life laying in the bed, 13 years of changing her diapers and taking care of his wife. Do you think that's what Robertson McQuilkin thought he was signing up for when he shared his vows? Commitment is hard. Marriage is hard. And committing to God sometimes is difficult. There will be some preachers and churches that tell you everything will be easy and comfortable and life will always go perfect. And I don't know where they get it from, but it just ain't the Bible. Elijah's scared, he's running for his life, he's depressed, you can argue he's suicidal, he's praying that he might die, I have had enough, Lord, but we're gonna end in a pretty positive way here. God meets Elijah exactly where he is. He meets him alone, depressed, 
under a tree. Last point this morning, number five, the one we want to close with. Being completely committed to God offers deep joy. Being completely committed to God, it doesn't make sense sometimes. It's difficult. Sometimes he asks us to do hard things, but it offers this deep joy. Robertson McQuilkin was committed to his wife, but he had some joy while doing it. These are his words again. He says, duty can be grim, but there is more. I love Muriel. She is a delight to me. Her childlike dependence and confidence in me, her warm love, her occasional flashes of wit that I used to relish so, her happy spirit, her tough resilience in the face of her continual distressing frustration. This is the line that jumped on me. I don't have to care for her. I get to care for her. And I think sometimes we look at our relationship with God and we go, oh, we have to do these things. No, you get to. You get to have a relationship with Jesus. You get to have a relationship with your creator. You get to experience this deep intimacy with the person that created, the only one that approves of you. No shame, no guilt, no regret. It offers deep satisfaction, deep happiness, deep joy, even when you're sitting alone under a broom tree. So if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. Yes, we want to completely commit to Jesus. We want to take that next step. We constantly want to be evaluating our commitment level to Jesus. But the most important thing to know about this story and the most important thing to know about your story is no matter how much your commitment level goes up and down like Elijah's is right now, the God of the universe is completely committed to you. Completely committed to you. That's why we worship. It's not about me. He actually can help me become more committed to him. But he's committed even when we're not committed. So maybe you're on the top of Mount Karma right now, mocking. (laughs) Things are going well for you. God will meet you there. Maybe you're depressed, wondering if life's even worth it like Elijah. God will meet you there. He's completely committed to you. So a couple of applications this morning. Now, all I do is preach God's word and come up with five little cute points to start with D. Okay, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And so if the Holy Spirit's already spoken an application to you, shut your ears off right now. These are just a couple of ideas, all right? The first one is this. When I think about commitment, I think about my wife. I think about my marriage. And as I read McQuilkin's story, I go, man, are there there things I need to do differently? Because I complain about some stuff that Robertson McQuilkin would have loved to have been able to share with his wife. So it's just a check on my radar, right? Maybe some husbands and wives need to have a conversation. Hey, where where are we headed right now? We've gotten away from some things we used to do, whatever that is. But the second one is this. As God swabs your heart this morning, he does your commitment test. How's your commitment level to God right now? July 18th, 2021. What's it look like between you and the Lord? Maybe it's just simply, as we read this, you're just not doing what he asked you to do. You are living in sin and you know you're living in sin. And so you need to do exactly what the Israelites did. You need to fall on your face and cry out, he is God and he forgives and he meets me where I am. Great chance to do that as we worship. Maybe you're a false positive. This is the one I thought about. How many people walk into our churches and they look the part, but they've never really completely committed their lives to Jesus. It's just a game they play. That happens in the Bible Belt a lot. So you believe, you go to church, but the reality is there's other things you worship. You've got a heart full of bales. Money, job, family, appearance, we've already mentioned them. Good things that have become God things and you do the same thing the Israelites did. You fall on your face and you say, no, he's God. We sang it just a minute ago. My heart will sing no other name but Jesus. And then the last one, maybe there's a decision you need to make. What's your next step with Jesus? That's the question you're going to hear me say all the time. What's your next step with Jesus? I'm not talking about working for your salvation. I'm talking about what's your, in discipleship, what's your next step as you grow in your relationship with Jesus? Some of you have a decision to make. Some of you have never completely committed your life to him. That's a great decision to make today. Some of you need to get baptized. August 8th, I'm going to go public with my faith in this Jesus. Some of you might want to partner. You know where Elijah really ran into problems is when he was alone. Really what partnership here is, is the invitation to be a part of the family. That's it. Have some ownership on where this church is headed and what we're going to do in this community. So whatever that is, 
Pray that you would, uh, you would deal with the Lord as he, as he swabs your heart here during worship. I'm going to ask Chuck and Angie Freeman to stand in the back. You need somebody just to pray with. We're going to try to start doing that every week. Uh, you can take advantage of that. I'll be down front. Let's pray. Lord, Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot of Bible. But it's good, Lord. It's good because it's, it's from you and it's, it's convicting and it steps on my toes to think, what are some other things that are competing for that top spot in my heart? What are those bales in my life that I want to run to for my worth, for my identity, for my security instead of running to you? And most of the things I'm tempted to run to, to you gave me. <laughs> Situations where I'm making good things, God things. So maybe that'll resonate with some folks in the room this morning. Lord, whatever decision folks need to make today, whether it's something with their spouse, whether it's baptism or partnership or forgiveness or confession. It could be a hundred different things, a change that they know you're asking them to make in their life, a conversation they know you're asking them to have in their radius, whatever it is. We get this hope, Lord, that when things were going south in Israel, you didn't raise an army, you raised one man, Elijah, and he went to work in his radius. Lord, that's what we want. We want some of that. So Lord, I'm, I'm really thankful as I think about Elijah showing up on Mount Carmel and asking you to prove yourself that you've already done that to us on the cross. You are completely committed to us, even though we kick it around and screw it up every day. We love you for that. We worship you for that. Would you meet us here, Lord, your spirit as we worship. It's in your name, amen. You guys can stand as we sing.